this young generation under my righteousness, not your own righteousness, but my righteousness, arise from your death. Arise. Amen. The Lord is speaking to some of you right now. As, as you feel like that word is coming just for you to come out of your, your depression, come out of your addictions, come out of your bondage into His liberty. Here we are now in Capernaum, the town of Jesus. In Hebrew, Kafir Nahum, which is the town of comfort. Now, Nahum is also the name of a prophet in the Old Testament, Nahmiah, which is Nehemiah, which is uh, the comfort of Yah, or Yahweh comforts. And that's the title of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the titles in Hebrew is, He's a Comforter. We know that He also sent us another Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, but that's the name of Jesus. That's name here, probably after the prophet, but the Lord made this His town. Let's see what the Lord has for us here. This young generation under my righteousness, not your own righteousness, but my righteousness, arise from your death. The stone has been replaced by grace. He took her hands and he says, Talita kumi. But the moment she put a trust in His righteousness and she received it, when she touched the rope of His righteousness, hallelujah, she was healed. Here we are at the synagogue in Capernaum. And this ancient synagogue was built over the synagogue that Jesus would have been in. And probably we are right at the spot where the ancient synagogue was and where Jesus cast a demon out of a, of a man who was in the synagogue. So here in Capernaum, there's something very interesting. Some years ago, when I came here, the doors were open at the back there, and I started walking through, and the Lord began to show me the events that happened here in its chronological order. And there's something the Lord wants us to see here. First of all, the Lord Jesus just cast the demons out of the most demonized man in the Gospels, the Gadarene demoniac. So on the way back, Jesus was heading towards this direction of Capernaum. He would have docked his boat there with all the disciples. And immediately the Bible says when he came on shore, Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, of this synagogue, he came to Jesus and he fell before him and pleaded with Jesus. My daughter is lying at the point of death. Please come, lay your hands on her and she shall lift. So Jesus started walking with, with Jairus all the way down. And along this pathway here, all the way to the house of Jairus. And I believe that I have discovered the house of Jairus, being that Jairus, the Bible says, is the ruler of the synagogue. So most likely the ruler of the synagogue would have a large house, like a parsonage. And uh, this house here, at the back here, uh, has a large gate. It's the largest house of any here that I've seen. So I would assume that his house is just behind the synagogue. It makes sense. Okay, and it, there's a direct path to the port where Jesus would have landed. Okay, so here Jesus walking down this path, this ancient path, together with Jairus and his disciples. And along the way, the woman with the issue of blood came in the press behind. There was a multitude following Jesus as well. And she touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says this woman was suffering from an, a, a bleeding hemorrhage. And according to the law, such cannot be seen in public, let alone touch anyone. And the Bible says she pressed through the crowd because she said this to herself. If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole.
Now, the Bible says she touched the hem of his garment. That would be the, the tassel. In Hebrew, the blue tassel is called takhelet. Very interesting, the takhelet is from the word kala in Hebrew, which means finished, complete. So you can say that she touched the complete or the finished work of Jesus. In fact, that's the one word cry of Jesus in Hebrew on the cross. He would have cried kula from this word kala, finished. So she touched the finished work of Jesus. And what 12 years of suffering from this disease, all the doctors cannot do. Jesus did it in an instant. She received from the Lord. You see, in the, according to the law, the law says this, Numbers chapter five, it says very clearly that God says to Moses, command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. It's almost as if the Lord, the, fa the father anticipate his son walking through here and there'll be a leper and he climbs the leper not far from here on his way into the Capernaum. And then everyone who has a discharge, there's the woman who touched him. And then someone who has been defiled by the dead. And that's Jairus' daughter who died. And what the law cannot do, the law says, put them all out. There's no answer. According to the law, there's no answer for them. But what the law cannot do, grace did. And what did Jesus do for the woman in the issue of blood? First of all, he cleansed the leper. The first group is the leper. He cleansed the leper just at the Mount of Beatitudes on his way down here. Okay, and then he cast the demons out. And then he walked by this way. And the Bible says, everyone who has a discharge must be put out of the camp. But instead of that, that woman touched the hem of his garment and instantly she was made whole. What did Jesus do with this discharge? He staunched it. He cleansed the leper. He staunched the discharge. And then he came to Jairus' house. What did he do with the dead? He raised the dead. Amen. Grace fulfills what the law can never do. The law has no answer for people with addictions, with problems, with sin in their life. They cannot help but have that discharge of sin and uncleanness in their lives. And it's just the fact that you're born into sin. But what the law cannot do, grace did. Jesus cleansed the leper. He staunched the discharge and he raised the dead. And his grace is available for you today. Amen. And, and there's something very interesting about the number 12. It's used twice in this one passage. That woman was suffering for 12 years when she touched the hem of his garment. Jairus' daughter was about 12 years of age. And there's no insti insignificant details in the Bible. It means there is a dispensation, let's talk about, like 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel. 12, the number of dispensation, referring to the law. So I believe that uh, that woman who came and touched the hem of his garment is like the church, the church age. Whereas Jairus' daughter would speak about Israel that was dead when Jesus came. But the woman came, notice that Jesus was on his way to resurrect Israel from her spiritual death. But along the way came the Gentile, came that woman who is a picture. Now she might be Jewish, but the picture there is of a church that's predominantly Gentile. The church has been hemorrhaging. And as long as the, the church is hemorrhaging, the church cannot be fruitful. And the Word of God in Isaiah 65 tells us that all our righteousness, not our sins, but all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Now, I don't mean to be crude, but, but filthy rags in Hebrew is actually soiled sanitary napkin. All our righteousness is like that. And as long as that woman has that discharge, all these 12 years suffering from that disease, she needs to have those napkins. It's a picture of a church suffering from self-righteousness and thinking that she can be fruitful by being self-righteous because all our righteousness are as filthy wrecks. But Jesus came and that, that tassel is His righteousness. When she touched the rope of His righteousness, hallelujah, she was healed. Amen. And that's what we need to receive from the Lord. Not, not 
pursuing our own righteousness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, which is a gift, and going about to establish their own righteousness, self-righteousness, have not submitted to the gift of righteousness, the righteousness of God. And that's, the, that's why the church is not fruitful today. And that's why the church is not seeing results today, because she's trusting in her own righteousness. But the moment she put a trust in His righteousness and she received it, she was healed. And immediately some, some people came from Jairus' house to where Jesus was and said, trouble the master no longer, all right? Your daughter is dead. The moment Jesus heard that, Jesus said to Jairus, be not afraid, only believe. Maybe you have received some bad news recently, and I believe the word of God for you today is, don't be afraid, only believe. And the Bible says he went on, went on all the way here and there were some professional mourners crying and, all, and Jesus went in and he took Peter, James and John. Have you noticed that these three were a, a special group of people among the 12 because Jesus always brought them to special areas where he wanted them to see something, like raising the date here. He brought Peter, James and John and put all the mourners out what is Peter, James, and John? These three names are mentioned again at Transfiguration as well as in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, Peter means stone. James means to replace, supplant. John is grace. Yohanan, God's grace. So in other words, Peter, James, and John tells us the stone, the commandments, the law, the stone has been replaced by grace. Hallelujah. Only when we realize that, that we are under grace and we depend on His grace and not by our self-effort, we are not under law. Only then can we see the dead race to life. Hallelujah. We'll see the church come alive and become fruitful and productive and the dead will be raised. So he, he put there all the professional mourners, I believe somewhere in this area outside the gate, you can see a large gate here and uh, he would have proceeded in with the parents, Jairus and his wife. By the way, Jairus' name in Hebrew means the enlightened one. So I believe that in the end times, here you see a, a beautiful picture of the dispensation, that woman, the issue of blood, a picture of the church healed before he comes again. And then he comes to Israel. And notice that Israel is a young Israel. The issue of the end times will be a young generation that does not know the Messiah. Amen. And it's going to raise her from the dead. He walked right in and... Um, this is what he said. He took the girl's hand and only the parents, Jairus and his wife and Peter, James and John were there. The stone has been replaced by grace. He took her hands and he says, Talita Kumi. Why is it left untranslated in the Bible? If you read it, you find it there, Talita Kumi. Because the talit is the tassel, that blue tassel that the woman with the issue of blood touch. It is His righteousness. No, there's nothing magical about the uh, healing properties of tassel because the Pharisees had large tassels. Nothing happens, right? But Jesus' tassel, He speaks of His righteousness. And uh, the, the whole prayer shawl that He would have worn is called the talit in Hebrew. So when He says talita kumi, in essence, He was actually putting His, his righteousness upon the dead body. And He says talita kumi. Komi, komis, arise. Girl under the talit. This young generation under my righteousness, not your own righteousness, but my righteousness. Arise from your death. Arise. Amen. The Lord is speaking to some of you right now. As, as you feel like that word is coming just for you to come out of your, your depression, come out of your addictions, 
come out of your bondage into his liberty. And how do you do that? By receiving his righteousness. The talit, Jesus talit. Not Pharisees talits, but Jesus talit. His righteousness. And when you begin to receive his righteousness, the Bible tells us in Romans 5.17, by one man's offense, death reigned by one. We see how death reigns. It is total. By Adam's sin, death reigned by one. Much more. Hallelujah for the much more. Grace is always much more. Much more those who receive what? Abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by Jesus Christ. So you need to receive these two things. Abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Now the devil would do his very best to cloud these two gifts from God. Because they are the ones, when you, when you receive these two gifts through the blood of Jesus, you will reign in life. So if the devil wants to stop you from reigning, what does he do? He tries to give you that, that sin consciousness, bring back the law because the strength of sin is the law. The law is holy, my friend, don't misunderstand me. I am for the law, for the reason God gave the law. And God never gave the law to justify men by. God gave the law so that all of us can see that we are sinners. Amen. And then we'll see our need for our Lord Jesus. Amen. So here, you find that woman with the issue of blood when she touched Jesus. Now, under the law, she would have been condemned. She's not supposed to be out in public, let alone touch anyone else. In those days, when the unclean touched the clean, the clean become unclean. But when the woman touched Jesus, hallelujah, grace is amazing. He made her clean. Amen. Under the law, sin is contagious. Under grace, righteousness is much more. It will infect you. Amen. I pray that you be infected with His righteousness. Amen. Be more conscious of it. Because the devil wants you to be sin conscious. Am I measuring up? Or even if you're doing something right, am I doing this enough? Have I prayed long enough? Have I studied the Bible long enough? Enough? Is it, nothing is ever enough when you are under the law. But when you're under grace, you realize He's done it all. You rest in Him. And my friend, when you rest in Him, you are being transformed supernaturally from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. And this is what we find here, the beautiful story. And the 12, 12 years, suffering, 12 years of age, uh, Jairus' daughter speaks of the dispensations when he comes again and he's coming back soon, my friend. And the church will be healed and Israel will be raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Even so, come Lord Jesus.